you don't know me, my name is Paul Abbott, and I am the president of the Jamestown School Board's Board of Education. When I had originally heard about this event, I had planned on uh, coming up and, and talking a little bit about how and why it was I came to be on the board. And um, I was going to talk a little bit about the timeline and the process that we went through in order to uh, choose Brett Apthorpe as our superintendent. A lot of you do have some familiarity with me, and you know how and why I came to be here. And in Brett's whirlwind tour since he started uh, in the middle of last summer, I know a lot of you have had an opportunity to meet him, and you know uh, a lot of the reasons why he's here. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take a page from Brett's book, and I'm going to do things a little bit different. I'm going to talk briefly about expectations and inspiration. I was always disturbed by the title of the program, and, and I know you all remember it, No Child Left Behind. To me, that sounds like the parenting equivalent of saying, let's try not to lose the children. <laughs> if you set, it sets the bar so low. Uh, what, I, what I've learned is that if you expect the minimum, you generally will get the minimum. In most groups, there will be those exceptions. There'll be the students who uh, attempt to exceed expectations. Whether those expectations are set by teachers or parents or a coach, they're always going to try to do a little bit more. As a former coach, I can tell you we all love these kids. You put them on autopilot and you just watch them go. They find their own inspiration. As I look out this afternoon at, at everyone who's here, um, I know that you all want what Brett wants, what his team wants, what, what, what I want, and what the rest of the board wants. We want all of our kids to find inspiration and, and to know um, that they can reach the possibilities that are out there. A journey, a journey is always easier to get through if you, if you want to get where you're going and if you believe that you can get there. How many people here have been to Disney before? Most everybody. Disney is just a last name. Adding land to a last name and then turning it to someone and say, it's an 18 hour drive with your kids, you should go. <laughs> That's not going to be enough. <laughs> By the same token, telling a student that we want them to score in a particular percentile or that we want them to demonstrate proficiency in a particular area or on a particular test isn't going to be enough for some students. But showing them the doors that can open when you have a diploma and you have command of the language and you have command of math and science and an understanding of history, or that by achieving a, uh, a particular score on an SAT or an ACT while you have a certain grade point average, can get you into that school that will help you achieve your dreams, that can inspire them. You then add to that things like music and sports and clubs that can help a student become a part of something, to feel engaged and to have a sense of pride not just in the classroom but also outside the classroom. Inspire everyone and expect their best. The idea is the easy part, the where we want to go part. When I turn the floor over to Brett in a moment, he's going to show you the blueprint for how we're going to get there. What I can tell you is that when uh, Brett introduced us to his plan, uh, myself and the rest of the board, I was very excited, and I know all of, uh, all of them were. Um, we as a school community can do this. On behalf of the entire board, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. A great deal of our success as a district will depend on our partnerships and relationships with people like you and the organizations that you represent. So now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, Dr. Apthorpe. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Paul. That was great, thank you. Thank you, Paul, and, and what, a great, what a great welcome, and I thought it was very much evoked the spirit of the, of the Board of Education. Uh, what a great welcome. Hey, great to see all of you. Um, 
I saw the list of names before I came and I, I felt excited. And uh, I know probably all of you know almost everybody in this room. I mean, this is a who's who of, of our community leaders. And I was really looking forward to this uh, with no sense of angst or nerves. Uh, then, however, I had an unexpected visitor who's here in the audience. <clears throat> My sister, Amy Piper. Amy, where are you? There's Amy. Amy. <laughs> Amy is a principal of uh, Fredonia Elementary, and I said, uh, you know, I always love seeing my sister, but I said, what are you doing here? And she said, well, Mom sent me. <laughs> Make sure you don't screw up. So with that, now I'm nervous. Just kidding. Just kidding. Good, glad Amy's here. Great educator. Uh, before I begin, you know, this comes together because of uh, the work of some special people uh, behind the scenes, and I really want to take some time to thank two very important members of the Jamestown uh, school family uh, who made this event possible. The first one is Nita Walter, and Nita's, um, she's probably outside, out there, right? <laughs> Nita is the district clerk and is a colleague, and uh, she loves this community as much as you do. She, and uh, her partner in crime, Kathy Padavianco, my friend over here, I'd like to publicly thank them both for putting all this together. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, our principal, Katie Russo. Is Katie here? There's Katie. I'd like to thank Katie and Ed. Where's Ed? Ed's right there. Um, you'll see some incredibly uh, cute videos of some beautiful children, and those two are responsible for pulling that together, so I wanted to thank them. I also wanted to thank the uh, Community Foundation for the great food uh, that they provided for us. Thank you, Tori. Tori? Thank you, Tori. That was nice, and I know... Um, when we're done, uh, probably there'll be nothing left because uh, they did a nice job. I'd also like to thank the Jackson Center staff for keeping this facility in just, uh, is this a national, uh, it really is a national landmark, this place. And isn't this beautiful, the setting? And, and if you've never been here before, uh, I would encourage you to, when we're done, to meander. I can do that, can I, Marion? Yeah, have them meander and look around. And especially for my uh, educational colleagues, um, even though I'm from the area, and I knew Justice Jackson was a Jamestown resident, I had no idea about, um, and I knew he was um, the head of the Nuremberg trials, but there's a beautiful exhibit uh, on the left when you leave here, and it's a tribute to a Jamestown teacher named Mary Willard, and Mary Willard was a teacher, an English teacher at Jamestown High School who had a profound influence on Justice Jackson, something that he recognized. And I think it's just a great reminder, you know, when these young kids that we work with every day, yeah, they might grow up to be Supreme Court justices. They might grow up to be a human rights justice. So take some time, if you would, because I know it'll recharge your batteries, because this is a tough job. So thank you to the Jackson Center. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, thank all of you for being here. All the, you know, uh, our representatives from our agencies and our charities and our community organizations, because your work, your hard work over the past few years is why we have a great opportunity in time here. And I want to thank you for that. And thank you for taking time to hear what the board and I would like to invite you to. When I apply to... Uh, When I came to uh, Jamestown and was looking at the demographics and student achievement, I mean, it's no secret, Jamestown Schools is one of the lowest performing schools in the state. And so, I, you know, I had the perception, having been in low achieving schools throughout the state, I had a perception of what I might see coming to Jamestown. And one of the, my perceptions was I fully anticipated probably having to rebuild a broken institution. Because too often schools, that have similar demographics and achievement as Jamestown are in a really bad way. Their schools aren't safe. Uh, their schools are dirty. Um, they're dangerous. And uh, my first six months here, uh, I was really, really taken aback by what I saw. And I want to thank my colleagues, my educational colleagues who are here, who are Jamestown administrators and teachers, because you have some of the best schools I've ever been in in my entire life. Our schools are loving places. Our schools are clean, they're safe, 
the staff genuinely love their kids. And it is amazing the job you have done. It really, really is. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And uh, instead of rebuilding an institution, what I'm here today is I'm going to try and bring in the Calvary. I'm going to try and bring you some help. I'm going to try and bring you some help. And because of the institutions that you lead and the organizations that all of you have put together, we have a really special moment in time, I think, to do something pretty cool together. Uh, and that's what I'd like to spend the next few minutes on, is talking about what is our schools about and talking about what might be some pretty neat opportunities. And I want to start with a personal story. So up on the screen are two ships. Uh, the bottom ship is the Golden Hind. And the Golden Hind is the, was the first ship to sail around the world. Uh, and you might remember from middle school history, Sir Francis Drake was the explorer on that. And Sir Francis Drake was able to sail around the world with this ship because if you look at the back of the ship, you see how it's, it's higher than the front of the ship. That was a very unique design. And that design, that engineering design, allowed ships to turn into storms when it was windy. And it was that technological achievement that allowed uh, Europeans to, to uh, you know, really colonize the world. So what does the Golden Hind have to do with us, right? The ship on the top there is the Sea Lion. Many of you may be too young to remember it. But the Sea Lion was built in Chautauqua Lake. It's the only authentic replica in the world ever, ever built in America. Sadly, it's not here anymore, but that's a story for another time. But in its heyday, that's what it looked like. And the Sea Lion was built by the most unassuming person, a guy named Ernie Cowan. And Ernie Cowan was a sheriff's deputy who did not come from money. He grew up in a blue-collar home, didn't go to college. And he was on a, a rescue on Lake Erie during a lake effect snowstorm in the 70s. And it was, and it was published in, there was a magazine once called Reader's Digest, I don't know if it's still around or not, uh, drama in real life. And that event, that a rescue, he went out at night in a small boat, um, whiteout storm, uh, and in that whole experience, he reflected on um, what he wished he had done with his life. And as a child of a blue-collar family, they only went on one vacation, and it was down in Virginia when he was a boy. And when he was down in Virginia, they toured the Mayflower too. And the Mayflower too was a pretty cool experience for him, but he was disappointed he couldn't ride it because no one could ride it, right? It was a walk-on, walk-off. So he left that experience committed to building a ship. Now, this is in the days before the Internet. So the guy who built the Golden Hind on the bottom, his name was Sir Matthew Baker. And Sir Matthew Baker was a shipwright. And shipwrights would make formulas and not make plans because uh, of intellectual, um, they didn't want people stealing their plans. So if they could memorize parts of the formulas, you couldn't, you couldn't steal the plans, they would own it. So Ernie Cowan, this guy who didn't go to college, wasn't a sailor, didn't come from money, didn't have the internet, he spent three and a half years translating Matthew Baker's treatise. Guys from Westfield, New York, Ernie Cowan. It's three and a half years doing that. So he translated the plans, but one of the challenges of that, to build a truly authentic replica, you need to use virgin white oak. So the wood that's unpainted on the sea lion on the bottom part of the ship is virgin white oak. And virgin white oak is very unique. It's really heavy. It's like gold when you hold it. It's really dense. But you can bend it without heat or steam. And for centuries, there's reasons why we were colonized is because they wanted our virgin white oak trees to build trees. But virgin white oak trees is almost gone. Well, many of you probably know the uh, Cheney Farm, or what was the Cheney Farm. It's now Cheney's Point, I think. Uh, and the father of that farm, Asa Cheney, who I remember well, uh, heard of Ernie's, Ernie's work. Well, on Asa Cheney's farm was seven 
of seven trees of the last stand of virgin white oak trees in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. When they built the Chautauqua Lake Bridge, it was delayed because it had some environmental challenges. And one of those challenges it had was that it was going to go through the last stand of virgin white oak trees in the Western Hemisphere. So when they lost and those trees had to come down, how coincidental was it that Ernie had contact with the last stand of virgin white oak trees that were donated? But what's a guy to do? I mean, you go up these trees, you know, 100 feet or so before you even get to a limb. These trees are gigantic. Where would you find a mill to do something like that? Well, between uh, Westfield and Sherman, a friend of his from high school, a guy named Carl Lyons had one of the biggest sawmills in western New York, out in the middle of nowhere. Carl Lyons, again, a, a county father, said, we'll cut that for you, and we'll cut those uh, 10,000 board feet of lumber for you. Hence the name Sea Lion. It actually comes from Carl Lyon. C initial, and then Lion, Sea Lion. Okay, so now you got your wood. Um, all the iron work that goes into a ship is a lot of iron. And if you want to build an authentic replica, you need to have a blacksmith. Well, there used to be a blacksmith outside of Mayville. I think, I think he's retired now, Mitch Fitzgibbons. And he had a, he had a um, blacksmith forge. It was called Skunk's Misery. <laughs> and he donated his time. And there's so many more of those artisans and unique things that occurred. And I was very fortunate as a young boy in Mayville. I was 12, I think. And uh, I was down around an old dumpy marina, poking around looking for uh, yards to mow or anything to make some money. And I met this guy, Ernie Cowan. And he said, yeah, you know, I'll pay you five bucks to mow the yard. And that... <clears throat> And they were building, just starting to build that ship in that marina down on, uh, it's now Sea Lion Drive, but it was Whalen Street Extension then. And then I was blessed to spend 10 years with that whole project, growing up with him and around them and watching this incredible thing. I mean, the Sea Lion weighed 150 tons. It has 200 miles of line on it. And it takes two miles to tack. And I'm sharing that story because after I've met, I think I've met almost with all of you individually. And if I haven't, I sure will soon. But I'm standing here today feeling like I haven't felt in a long, long time. Ernie was able to build that ship because it was a special moment in time. There were special people with special resources committed to do something. And that's how I feel right now in this room with all of you. In this room, I, I firmly believe, are the people and resources who can really change our educational system and our economy. And, and that's what I want to pitch to you tonight, today, is an invitation to be a part of something. Um, those of you who may be pessimistic and waiting for a sales job, you know, where's the money on this? This isn't about money. I'm not going to be asking about money. I'm not going to ask you for a dime. The board and I, we're not asking, asking anybody to do nothing more than what they're already doing, but doing it together. And that's what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about our school. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, Ed. We didn't have your headphone on. <laughs> <laughs> I love this uh, Calvin Hobbes cartoon because too often in each of our fields, everybody thinks we can fix it simply, right? Whether it's mental health, whether it's poverty, economy, just do one thing and it's all better. It's a, just a, a tree sneezing, right? Well, it's a little more complicated. Let's say about our school. So Jamestown, over the last uh, 15 years, has had a decreasing K-12 enrollment, but it's also had an increase in three- and four-year-olds. So the total bodies in our schools is uh, not too different over the last 15 years. PK stands for pre-kindergarten. Our school has become diverse and increasingly diverse. Um, you can see the changes since 2000. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have an increase in the Hispanic population. 
and in 2010, you'll see multiracial because that became a legal category at that date. That's why that date was started at that time. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank Jesse Joy. Thank you for putting this data together. So low income, those are students who live in poverty. English learners are students who do not speak English as a native language. And SWD is our students with disabilities. Let's talk about academic achievement. So I share this slide just to offer perspective. These are four, uh, three schools similar to Jamestown, Middletown, New York, uh, Niagara Falls, and Dunkirk. And what I did was I highlighted some key demographic area, the key demographics. And what I ask you to do is take a second and look at those schools. And just by looking at the demographic information, do you think you can pick out the lowest performing school based on what that uh, demographic suggests? <coughs> Got it? So <clears throat> if we look at kids in grades three through eight and their ELA and math scores and, and you put them together, we call that a performance index. You can see how these schools have performed over time. And you'll see uh, Middletown, the, the green school. I mean, I know when I looked at that chart, I said Middletown had the tougher demographics by far. And the, the reason I share it is to give hope you know, we don't, we're not, we don't have to be in this situation. Others are doing well, and we can too. And quite frankly, I'm a more believer of we should be up above the top line, which is the New York average, because I don't think there's anything average about what we do. <clears throat> Here's our ELA proficiency. The, the, the barks all the way to the left is the one that's most troubling to me. What that says is we only have 23% of our kids, 23% who are proficient in English, English language arts. And that's the key. You know, literacy is the key at that young age. That's an alarming number because you, you, this is the gateway to the other disciplines. So if we look at the flip side of that, the lowest performing, again, uh, so starting with the left, 46% of our kids, almost half, have the lowest possible ranking in English language arts. Lowest possible. That's amazing. That's staggering. ELL. 92% 90, of our ELL students have the lowest possible proficiency in ELL, ELA. It's like a math. It's almost the exact same with math. 23%, the red bar all the way to the left, only 23% of our three through eight students are considered proficient. That's not being an expert. That's not being top of the line. That's just being at grade level, being proficient. <clears throat> and then the flip of that, lowest performing, similarly to ELA, half of our students have the lowest possible, lowest possible score you can get in math proficiency. That's alarming. That's alarming. So we look at students who graduate over four years. So three out of every uh, four of our kids in four years, in a four years time frame will graduate.
And then here we look at our subgroups. Again, this is over a four-year time because kids do grad. Some kids take five years. Some kids take six years. And Dr. Mack is always good at reminding me that. How about that statistic all the way to the right? If you're an ELL kid that comes to Jamestown, you have a 0% chance of graduating in four years. Percent of kids who drop out in four years. These are really tough numbers. And it's, you know, when you look at these, it's like I saw those before I came to Jamestown. That's why I said I thought I'd come into a broken system. It's, it's, so, it's so contradictory. It's like an oxymoron when you see these data and you walk into our schools, because our schools are incredibly beautiful places. They're safe, they're loving, they're, the teachers are on their game, the principals are on their game. So, so what's going on? Well, let's put some, let's put some uh, faces to our statistics. I just grabbed a, a, a class of kids, and um, because it's always, to me, the faces behind the numbers that's most important. So in this fourth grade class, if those two kids remain ELL students, they have a 0% chance of graduating. And I'll tell you what, if you asked one of those kids if they had a 0% chance of graduating, they'd say there's no way. Something's happening. This is the crux of the problem. 72% of our kids live in poverty. That is an enormous amount. We're a traditional school. We have school eight, nine months out of the year. We have you know, the same teachers, class sizes, the same thing that every other school has. But this is a tidal wave. This is overwhelming the system. I don't care how good of a teacher you are. You know, you talk about a suburban school, they maybe only have three kids that come with poverty. <clears throat> Fifty percent of our kids with disabilities will graduate. So those are the numbers and where we are, but yet it's not the numbers, it's the kids. And if you, if you don't know the kids, you're missing everything. You're missing everything. Because these kids are awesome. These kids, you go talk to them, they don't wanna be crackheads. They don't wanna be going to jail. They don't wanna be dropouts. They're beautiful, beautiful young people. And uh, I'm going to ask, um, could you show, uh, introduce you to some of our kids? An artist. And you want to be an artist when you grow up? Why do you want to be an artist? Because I love to paint. You love to paint. Mm -hmm. I would like to be a video game creator and like be like one of those big people, be a big game producer and be very popular. So you want to make video games? Yeah. Why would you want to do that? Because people like video games a lot, and the more people you get, the more popular and the more self-esteem you get. I want to be a lot of different things, like a game maker, a teacher, or a doctor, or a kitty cuddler, because that's a job in France. A kitty cuddler? A, and a toy, a toy maker, a movie maker, and a cartoon maker because I want to be well known when I grow up. A cop. You want to be a police officer. Why? Cuz they cuz they when bad guys steal you they they have handcuffs to under arrest the bad guys. Any other reasons? Why else? And cuz they have tasers. <laughs> you want to be a police officer. Tell me why. Cuz then I 
I could see how to do stuff there. Like what? What does a police officer do that you think you want to do? Drive, like, big trucks. Drive big trucks? What else do police officers do? Pull over people if they go too fast. They pull over people that go too fast, and you want to be a police officer. Okay, thank you. A vet. You want to be a vet? Tell me why. Because I like animals. You like <coughs> animals? And what does a vet do? It takes care of animals and saves mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I want to be someone that, like, goes, like, around and, like, like, someone that goes around, like, the world and tries to look at, like, interesting animals that they haven't seen before. Uh-huh. Why do you want to do that? Because I'm, I really like animals. Mm -hmm. So you want to go to different parts of the world to discover maybe things we don't know about certain animals. Yeah. A veterinarian. You want to be a veterinarian. Why? Because um, I love um, animals, and my favorite thing to do is play with them, and I'm really, like, good at training them. A teacher. You want to be a teacher. Tell me why. Um. What do you like that teachers do? What's something that Mrs. Forrester does that you really like? Math. Math? So you want to teach math? What else? Um, a doctor. You want to be a doctor? Why? Because I get to do really cool stuff. Like what? The body. I get to take care of people. I like to be a skills teacher and a math teacher and a, and a rock star. Why do you want to do that? Because they're my favorite things and they're my, my special things I can do when I grow up. So I can, and I like to be a cop because cops are good to me and special to me. I like cops. Isn't that an incredible contradiction to the data that I shared? And this is Jamestown. These are Jamestown kids. And, and thank you, Katie, for finding these kids, because I see these kids all over. And it's such an oxymoron, the data and the kids. So what's happening? Well, I'd like to propose there's several things happening. Because these kids don't want to be. They want to be doctors and vets and, you know. I'm going to share this with the chief, because I think the police chief should show some of this to his. <laughs> you know. So we're learning a lot, and he probably... Coincidentally, yeah, this was on 60 Minutes last week, um, about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. <clears throat> and it's basically kids in poverty, particularly in poverty, it's true for all kids, but particularly kids in poverty, they suffer um, often from traumatic events. And we call them ACEs. And the research on ACEs is really pretty profound and overwhelming. And for every experience, a traumatic experience a child has, they, they call it an ACE. Simply put, you get one ACE as a score. And the more ACEs you have, the more um, trauma impacts your ability to learn. Uh, vets who suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome is because they've accumulated too many aces. So I want to give you a real life example and sadly, sadly actually most of you in this room are well aware of this problem. Um, this is a, an example of, a, this is a sixth grade girl and uh, at Jamestown and I was in the main office uh, of that school, one, that middle school one day and there was a young, this girl was in the office and she had a stomach ache. Stomach aches are very common, right? And uh, the, the, uh, the lady in the office said, honey, come on, I'll take you down to the nurse, like they so often do. And then the principal pulled me aside and said, this young lady that morning um, got up and was in a, in a drug, you know, drug-dependent home and all the garbage that goes with that. She gets up with all that nonsense laying around her and whatnot. 
She gets herself together. She gets herself ready, goes, comes out the front door, and finds her two dogs dead with their throat slit on the sidewalk. Probably the two things she loved the most, socially and emotionally. And she went to school because school was safe. School is where she needed to be. She didn't have a stomach ache. She had a traumatic event. She had a traumatic event. So this young lady, she grows up in poverty, which is an ace. She's living in a drug-dependent home. That's an ace. And then that horrific image of those dogs, that's an ace. And that day in class, now this young lady is a perfectly normal kid with a perfectly average IQ. And that day in school, they're learning fractions. And she's kind, sweet, loving, and quiet. She's not learning fractions. She's not learning fractions. She's dealing with trauma. So the fraction train goes on. Tomorrow, it's decimals. She's not going to be learning decimals. Kids have to be socially, emotionally safe and well in order to learn. It's as, it's as a biological realism as people need water. You have to have that. And what we're learning about ACEs and poverty is um, those beautiful children that you saw earlier are inundated with ACEs as they grow. We've changed our vernacular. You probably remember the principles. I know my mom <laughs> would say, you know, what was wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Um, but now we need to speak to kids as to not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you. Let's talk about the last few days. What's been going on at home? What's been going on in your world? So going back to my class, our average class, with 72% of our, our kids in poverty, we estimate that we have at least 3,600 kids who have at least one ACE in our school district. These are estimates that come from the National Institute of Health. We estimate we have over 1,600 kids with two or more ACEs. And then you can see the, the multipliers for uh, the behavioral issues that goes with that. We estimate that we have over 500 kids, 500 kids who suffer as a uh, war vet suffers from post-traumatic stress syndrome. The only difference is these are developing minds. These aren't developed minds. These are developing minds. That's a huge number. So go back to how is it we have beautiful schools and beautiful kids and why I need to call the cavalry in? We need some help. We need some help. Second thing is going on, literacy. So this is a graph that's meant that uh, I, uh, I put together. Uh, the horizontal graph represents being at grade level for reading. So let's talk about the example of, of a child going from kindergarten to first grade. The middle income child, um, starting from left to right. It's June, they get out for summer, and in the summertime, every student regresses in reading. That's natural. Every kid does that. And middle class kids and upper class kids, they recover very quickly when school starts again, and they're up on grade level. It's a lot different for kids in poverty. For kids in poverty, not only do they suffer uh, what they call a summer slide, but they don't recoup, they don't recover, they don't catch up, they don't get back on grade level. And what happens is it accumulates, it accumulates. So what you have happen is the mid, when they go to the middle school, the kid on the left, he's reading on grade level, but the kid in poverty, he goes into middle school at a second grade reading level. So what we do, is we love our kids in elementary school. 
and do the very best we can. I mean, our people are doing some phenomenal things for our kids, and I'm so happy that they're oases for our kids, because they are. But the system isn't designed, the traditional system isn't designed for the type of kids we have. So what happens is they get to middle school and they're reading at a second grade level. And you know, middle school now, you all remember those days, middle school? Right, the body changes, emotions, right, self-conscious, and particularly today's world with social media, kids are really self-conscious. Um, they begin to see behaviors and all the consequences that come with that. And we socially promote those kids through middle school because we know the downside of not doing that. So we, we socially promote them, and then they go to the high school, reading at an elementary level, and that's where academics are real. Whether you're gonna go into vocational, or whether you're gonna go to college, the academics are real. But you can't read. And if you can't read, you're not gonna do well in the other disciplines. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna drop out. You're gonna drop out. So this literacy thing is a big thing. So our challenges that I've shared with you here is the data resiliency, which means our student achievement data hasn't changed for the last at least six, seven years. It's been really consistent, even though a lot of people have been working really hard to try and make a difference. The poverty and trauma in our community and the literacy challenges of that summer slide, these are the, these are the challenges we face. But what I am here to, to share with you and what I believe, going back to that magical moment in time of, um, of my sea lion experience is, I think we have incredible opportunities. I think this is a very special moment in time. And the opportunities rest with you and me. <clears throat> the labor market, which I'm gonna talk about, the local labor market is not what I thought it was. It's actually incredibly um, to the good. The education and training we have and the agencies and charities many of you represent. <clears throat> so these are opportunities. People, there's people in this room who know how to treat kids with trauma, clinically. Kids who suffer from ACEs, who are healed and become healthy, develop an above average level of resiliency that leads them on to much success in life. That's true, that's a research fact. Kids aren't doomed by the trauma they experience. There's people in this room, experts in this room, who know exactly the people that can help kids overcome trauma. Literacy is not a, is, is not a secret. <clears throat> we know how to teach kids to read. We understand the complexities of reading. These kids who suffer from literacy uh, challenges, they have very unique problems, very unique challenges. And there are people in this room who know how to diagnose each of those deficiencies and prescribe an individual uh, action and treatment that will help that child overcome their literacy challenges. That's a fact. People know how to do that. The biggest, I think, misunderstanding with the reading is people think if you get all these kids together in a room and they read the same book, everybody's a better reader. Well, for the average reader, that might be. But that's not helping the kid with literacy problems. They need a specialized individual um, treatment, if you will. <laughs> we know how to write curriculum that delivers real world skills. And we know in this room how to develop character education programs. Provide real, real world, which is always important for kids in poverty. What does it really look like in the real world? College, career, and what it means to be healthy. So, are the Turners here, Kathy? I saw them on the list. Okay. Uh, they're uh, uh, owners of Blackstone. I went around and I met with many of the local businesses, and these are just some of the, the businesses I met. And what I was surprised to learn, are, are my friends from Cummins here? There they are. Thank you. Um, and so, like, I've over at Cummins, what I was, I heard over and over and over again is, there's jobs, jobs, jobs. We can't fill our jobs. I heard it everywhere. 
whether it was when I met with Betsy Wright at WCA, or at Commons, or at Jamestown Container, or the Resource Center, everywhere I went, I heard the same story. We cannot fill the jobs we need, good paying jobs. The guys at the Jamestown uh, Container were telling me, you know, they had a, a vacancy they'd been trying to fill, and it would have been $40,000 with benefits, um, 401ks, the whole big deal. I'm like, something's not, what's going on here? Same problem they all face, and, and correct me, Lori, if I am not, if I didn't listen well. Life's, uh, people skills, like life skills, getting people to come to work on time, come to work on a regular basis, be respectful of other people, pass a drug test. So we have jobs in this community. You know how many small cities in New York State in poverty wish they had jobs available? It's, it's unique, and it's a great opportunity for us. College and career training. In our own backyard, if you've, never, if you've never been inside the Manufacturing Institute down by JCC, it's unbelievable. Not what I thought it was. State-of-the-art, contemporary. It's a facility that has, um, it trains folks into the uh, entry-level areas of manufacturing. A very impressive place. It's right here in our own backyard. Uh, BOCES, of course, has long been a leader in the field of training kids for careers. And JCC and JBC in Fredonia. And then the benevolence. The lastly, the benevolence of this community is amazing. It's amazing. Look around this room. Okay, can you tell how many small cities of poverty wish they had the foundations, the charities, and the agencies that are represented in this room right now. Jamestown, this is really is an amazing thing, and again, an amazing opportunity for us. And I just grabbed some of the, sorry I didn't ask for permission when I cut and pasted. I'll probably get in trouble for that. <clears throat> so there's our challenges and, and our opportunities, and I think that everyone would agree what we're doing Something's got to be different because we're not getting the results. None of us are getting the results we need. So here's what we'd like to propose. This is what the board and I have been working on. Three big things and why we're here. We'd like to be real intentional in our secondary schools about looking at our curriculum, working with our local manufacturers and our local colleges on what does a real uh, course structure or outline or pathway need to look like that will result in a child getting a Jamestown diploma that will allow them to go be successful in your workplaces or go into our college or universities. And we would like to start a conversation with all those folks who are involved in that, um, working with our school leaders on, we want to be intentional. We want to make sure, and I'm speaking to our manufacturing friends and our college friends, we want to make sure that we're literal, we're intentional about courses that align with your needs. Not just rhetorically, we want physical eyes on it because we want to make sure that that diploma provides those kids the opportunities it's intended to provide. So in order to do that, we need to collect folks together who represent businesses, educators, and people who are interested in mentoring. The second thing we'd like to do is we want to get real intentional about the type of kids we have. One of the unique opportunities we have is Rogers Elementary School that's presently vacant. Rogers Elementary School is actually the newest elementary uh, building of the Jamestown Public Schools. <clears throat> and what we'd like to do in this academy is we'd like to have it for kids in, ki for kids in grades 5 through 12. And we would like to have welcome many of you to be a part of this. So imagine a school, if you will, that's like a mall, a shopping mall. But instead of stores, 
social services, um, mental health offices, physical health offices, health clinics, educators, family mediators, social workers, counselors, all housed in this, in this facility. So we go back to my, <coughs> my sixth grade friend, that little girl that had the horrible ACE incident with those dogs. Let's have this little girl be able to go to a place that is appropriate for child development. And this is really important. We're not talking about an institution here. Institutions fail. Alternative <coughs> institutions fail because they're not about kids. They're about institutional structures. So we're talking about a school that is, loves kids, embraces kids, welcomes kids. So our little friend, who's going to be living in that tough house until she graduates, can go to a place where she's safe, she's working with people who are specialists in child development and trauma, and she's in an academic setting where she can not fall behind, not miss fractions, not miss decimals, let her get healthy, let her learn and acquire levels of resiliency to allow her to go back to school resilient and not behind academically. And we know there's people in, the, in this room who can do that. Our secondary kids, you know, our, our traditional school, I mean, the high school, Jamestown High School, is un, it's a great place. It really is. I just am amazed. I'm always saying to Mike, I mean, I keep waiting for something bad to happen every time I walk around. It's very disappointing. You know, I can never discipline anybody when I walk around the high school. It's just, it's, you know, it really lets me down. Um, but we have a lot of kids who aren't going. We have a lot of kids who aren't going because it doesn't fit for them. They're dealing with garbage like you can't believe. So let's engage those kids and let's get them to come back to school. Let's, the, the number, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, to many of you, forgive me, but the level of anxiety and depression among our youth is, is staggering. And we see that with kids not coming to school, school phobia, you know, it's, and it's getting worse. So let them come to Rogers. And let them come to a year-round program. So that when we get these kids back into school, we not only give them the clinical support they need, um, but we're also going to give them the academic support, but we're also going to give them job training, job coaching, and all of them get life skills training so they're respectful in the workplace. They come to work on time. So that once we have them healthy in a healthy environment, that's why it's year-round. We have incredible professionals. I don't know if any of you know Eric Davis. Is Eric here? Right there, Eric. Eric's taught me a lot. Um, I'm going to screw up your title, pal, but uh, you know, I think of him as a liaison to our community. And, and Eric has taught me that you can engage the disengaged. He goes out to the community and, finds, you know, and deals with the kids who don't want to come to school. And guess what? They come to school because there's somebody who, wants, who, who cares about them. And we're going to get more of those kind of professionals who are going to help them get into Rogers and again, it's not meant to be an institution. It's meant to be a voluntary place. Um, would do this, would, would like to construct this school. That we're very blessed to have uh, two BOCES leaders here, John and Danielle. Where are you guys? Okay, I'll go to you. I was afraid you might snuck out the back. Yeah, John and Danielle from BOCES um, embracing this concept of let's make this a regional school so that, you know, Southwestern, Faulkner, Cruzberg, if they want to participate. Um, and let's get the professionals together and create an, uh, a, a school that's good for kids. So I would envision, for example, um, you would have the mental health professionals and school psychologists work together on what does it look like to receive kids, to evaluate kids, and to treat kids. And then we would have another group made up of like principals and educators and how do we educate these kids. So for the regional school, 
we're hoping we have these folks representing these places and these fields who will want to talk some more about this. And, and seeing Father Luke reminds me that um, uh, interesting in, uh, change and evolution in social sciences and psychology, but now the term uh, spiritual poverty is recognized by the field as legit. So clergy is very important. And Dan might be here too. I don't know if I saw Dan. Oh, there they are in the back. <laughs> Lastly, the last thing, uh, summer literacy. So <clears throat> remember that summer slide? We probably have thousands of kids that, that are below re reading level, right? <clears throat> so imagine this. In the summer, a bus comes to a five-year-old's house, picks him up, brings him to a school, feeds him breakfast, let them have an hour or two with a teacher, a literacy teacher. And I got to tell you, K-4 kids, they love their teachers. It's the high schoolers that don't like summer school. <laughs> okay. The little ones, they all love it. But let them get an hour or two of literacy, that technical piece I told you about, not just everybody sit together and read a book. While that's important, we need to be clinical and intentional of diagnosing the literacy needs of each of these children and prescribing a summer-long program for each child. So we do that for an hour or two. And then we turn them over to the Boys and Girls Club. We turn them over to the Y. We turn them over to Infinity. We turn them over to Camp Anyasa. We turn them over to one of the many van fantastic summer programs that many of you are responsible for. They get lunch, and then wherever they are, however they are, we bus them back home at 4 o'clock. And we do that for them all summer. From our end, we're able to do that because Amanda Giesing, where's my friend Amanda? Oh, she's out here. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Amanda was really a key part of us securing a, a, a large grant, a 21st century grant, that will allow us for probably the next four years be able to fund this. And we're hoping to work with our friends from the Promise Fund, and sitting there and then looking at my friend Lillian Nay, that as we understand what it costs to do this from a school's perspective, from school, it's the bus and the teachers, that's our cost, and uh, see if we can't work with a promise fund to hopefully maybe pick up the cost when the grant runs out so that we can make it a, uh, we want it to be permanent. So the notion here is then we keep our kids not only falling behind in reading, but think of the social emotional experiences they're getting, right? I mean, our summer programs that, that Jamestown has, second to none, and how often that our most neediest kids often can't go but we can get them there. So now these kids can go to middle school on grade level versus being at a second grade reading level. So we're hoping all of these folks will be a part of that conversation. So this is what I call a bar napping conversation you know, kind of doodling on the bar napkin with your pen, trying to solve problems. These are three very big ideas and three very big concepts. Aligning student programming. Have a year-round success academy at Rogers. And have a community, uh, a community summer literacy camp. So we're tackling literacy, we're tackling trauma, we're tackling the needs of our local labor market and our educational institutions. Because it's complicated. It's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts, more than just the tree sneezing. So these three ideas are really our ideas because they come from our work together and speaking with many of you, asking you what your hopes and dreams were for Jamestown. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for your passions for our kids. Uh, we're in a special moment in time. I'm, I'm really convinced of it. If we're going to, in our lifetime, 
change this community that we love for the better, the, the time is now. You think about the collection of people we have in this room, the collection of opportunity and resources that we have right now. Um, I don't know about you guys, but man, I want to take a big swing at it, as big of a swing as I can. Because I love this place. I love this community. I have deep roots here. Um, I remember when. So lastly, um, we'd, I'd like to invite you to consider to be part of a conversation. So where we go from here is our educational leaders in our school, myself, we're going to be looking at each of those three things separately and tackling them. And if, you would, if you're interested in being a part of one of those conversations, or two, or three, um, please leave a card or sign your name on the sheet out here, and we'll send you an email about the next conversation related to each of these respective pieces. And we're going to do this together. So for example, the summer literacy camp, that, so I'm envisioning you know, us with the summer program sitting down together and saying, how can we dovetail this? What do we need to do to get, you know, what does that need to look like for you? What does that need to look like for us? You know, it's a collaboration. It's a community collaboration. It's not a my way or highway. None of this is a my way or highway because it's too complicated. So you like to have the no commitment yet? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your passion for our community. And most of all, thank you for supporting our kids because they're the ones that need your help the most. So thank you. And as you leave, please so um, um, dignify the great elegant edibles food and the community foundation's provision and grab some stuff on the way out. Thank you very much. And I'll be around for the rest of the Thank <laughs> you.